Good morning. Welcome to our lesson for Sunday, March 14. Our theme for the quarter is Prophets Faithful to God's Covenant. Today's lesson is on the prophet Joshua, prophet of conquest. Our scripture text is Joshua 5, 13 through 6, 5, 15, 16, and verse 20. This lesson is a lesson in obedience, faith, and trust. And it's a lesson in God's way of giving a victory based on the faith that we have. Uh, if you remember last Sunday's lesson was on uh, Moses. So here this Sunday we're talking about Joshua who took over the leadership of the children of Israel after the death of Moses. Our aim for today's lesson is to explain how Joshua acted obediently to the vision of God to reflect on our inefficiencies when challenges overwhelm us, to commit to obeying God, especially in challenging times. There are certain words, key words in our background scripture that I'm going to talk about before we get to our actual scriptures. Um, one is Joshua. Joshua is the leader that took over the uh, leadership of the children of Israel into the promised land. Moses died before making it to the promised land. So God appointed Joshua as leader. He was a mighty military commander, and he believed in the promise that God had made to him concerning the promised land. So in this story, what Joshua did before he actually got to Jericho, he sent spies over to check out the land and the people. And in the process, um, the Jericho leaders got aware that there might be Israel spies um, in the land of Jericho. And so they went searching for these spies. And there was a harlot named Rahab who actually hid these spies and protected them from these soldiers. Joshua also, when he decided to, to go into Jericho, he had to cross what we know, now know as the Jordan River and what was known back then as the Jordan River. And in order for him to cross, the waters had to be stopped. So God here again performed a miracle by stopping the water at Adama so that Joshua and his group of Israelites could cross. And if you remember, God did the same thing for Moses when he parted the Red Sea so they could get away from the Egyptian soldiers. So here we are um, at the River Jordan. And at this point, let's say that, that they have crossed the river. And one thing that they did after they crossed the river was that they set up a monument, a memorial to what God had done for them. He instructed them to take 12 stones and build a monument so that future generations could understand how God had intervened at the River Jordan. And it's through this memorial that they passed this story on from generation to generation. The other important word in this background scripture is Jericho. Jer Jericho was a city on the southern part of the Jordan Valley. Jericho was the near east road that connected the Transjordan, which is now Jordan, to what we call Palestine today. This all occurred in 1405 BC. The city of Jericho really was not a big city. It was a small city considered an oasis, which is in the middle of dry land. But Jericho itself was very fertile with palm trees, fruit trees, um, all of the uh, unique things that you would want in a city that was self-sufficient. Jericho also was a busy urban center. Even going back as far as the Stone Age, it was a walled city, which means it was protected by a wall. And in this wall, you also had people living within this wall, which is where Rahab lived. She lived actually within the wall. And Jericho, it's the first city that the children of Israel had to conquer before they actually got to the promised land. And so God worked with them to give them instructions on how to conquer Jericho. And as we get into our scriptures, we will see 
that it was not the usual military plan. Um, also, Joshua was, was thinking that because this city was so rich <clears throat> that it would make a good city for the first sacrifice to God because this city had only the best of things, best trees, best fruit. It was a city of great wealth and it was actually a tropical oasis. So he was thinking ahead of time and that once we, he allowed us to cross that we would take the things that we find and make them a sacrifice to God. We're now going <clears> to <throat> deal with our scriptures. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to discuss each scripture as I go so that I don't read them all and come back. Our lesson scripture, our first set of scripture comes from Joshua 5, 13 through 15. It's entitled Messenger of God's Plan. And so in this I'm going to read these first three verses. Joshua 5, 13 says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Joshua 5 and 14 says, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the most of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Joshua 5, 15 says, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thou shoes. From thy foot, for the place whereon thou stand is holy ground. And Joshua did so. <clears throat> this is the first indication that God gave Joshua as far as what he was to do. Um, if you remember the story of Moses, Mo Moses was in the mountains and he saw this burning bush, and it was God who had appealed to him in a, a burning bush. And he was told to take his shoes off because the ground he was standing on was holy ground. So when Joshua, in verse 513, he saw this man who was actually God's messenger. And he thought that because there was a sword drawn that this person was against him. And when he revealed that I am God's captain, I am come because of this divine instruction that I am to give. And so what this um, says to us that sometimes we need to wait on God's instruction and wait patiently for him to tell us what to do. So in verse 14, when Joshua realized that this person was of God or from God, he fell down to worship him. Remember, Moses did the same thing. But also an important fact, he said, take your shoes off because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. And in the meantime, once he did that, he asked him, what is it that God wants me to do? And so this is where Joshua was beginning to get instruction from the, the captain of the Lord's army that he had sent to warn Joshua. God always give good directions. <clears throat> Sometimes we don't understand why he gives them the way he gives them, but in this story, you will see what he told them to do and think about us today as we get into what he was ordered to do. Our next set of scriptures comes from Joshua 6, 1 through 5. It's called the plan to conquer Jericho. Remember I just said that God sent this captain to let Joshua know that God had a special plan for him. I'm going to read all of these verses, then go back and take them one at a time. <clears throat> the plan to conquer. Jo Joshua 6 and 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Joshua 6, 2. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into the, thine hand Jericho, 
and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Joshua 6, 3. And ye shall com compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus thou shalt do six days. Joshua 6, 4. And seven priests shall bear before the ark, seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. Joshua 6, 5 says, And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all of the people shall shout with great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down, and the people shall ascend upon it man straight before him. What this means is when uh, it says that Jericho was shut up straightly means that by it being a walled city it had this huge gate and because the people of Jericho had gotten notice that the children of Israel were outside waiting to cross the Jordan to come in and take over the city. So what they did, they closed the gate and so no occupants would would come in and nobody could go out. And they were actually afraid. The gates were locked. And then um, the Lord said unto Joshua, I'm going to give you Jericho. And it's not going to be a usual circumstance. He said he gonna, he's going to deliver the king and the people and the mighty men of value, which mean, means their army, their soldiers. But this is not the usual way that you fight battles. You know, it's not like they were actually going into war. So God's plan was a unique plan, and if we think about, if we had this instruction today, he said you should compass the city, which means you should surround the city and go around the city once every day for six days. This is, um, wasn't very difficult to do because Jericho was situated on about seven acres of land, about a half a mile around. And so that wasn't, that wasn't very hard for them to do, to walk around the city um, once a day for six days. Now, just imagine, this is a plan of war. If God told us in this day and age to go down and walk around the capital six days, once a day, can you imagine what would be said? How much we would say, well, why does that? That doesn't make sense. But this is not Joshua's plan. This is God's plan. So going back over to Joshua 6 and 4, God is continuing to give instruction. And he said, you should have seven priests who will go first who will bear the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was with the children of Israel from the moment they left Egypt. And it is believed to have been symbolic of God's presence with them. And he said they should have ram's horns. Ram's horns are important because they were used to celebrate the Jubilee, which came every 50 or 75, 50 years. And so in the time of celebration of Jubilee, they would sound these horns so that people could start their celebration. And in Joshua 6 and 4, the other instruction he gave, he said, on the seventh day, instead of walking around Jericho once, you are to walk around Jericho seven times. And the priests should blow their horns and their trumpets. Now there was an order, you know, it, this was like a parade. And we find that first, the soldiers went first, then the seven priests with the Ark of, Ark of the Covenant and the trumpets. Then the rear guard, the real soldiers. So actually the Ark of the Covenant and the priests were in the middle. And so the way this was done, it was done so that Joshua or anybody else in this group could not take credit for what God had planned for them. And so this is, this is quite, quite unusual. And it says, and it shall come to pass 
when they make this long blast or sound the trumpet, or they hear the trumpet sound, God had promised them, the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and people shall ascend upon every wall or every rubble, because it will definitely come down. And so this was a promise. Remember, Joshua had to keep the faith that this was going to happen because God said it was going to happen. And he had to be, he had to trust God for the promise that God had made them. When we say a covenant, that's an agreement or promise that God makes. And so he promised the children of Israel that they would make it to Canaan, which was considered the promised land. But in the meantime, you got this city in the middle, in the way. And so they had to move Jericho out of the way before they could get to Canaan. Okay, our next set of scriptures is from Joshua 6, 15 to 16, and verse 20. This one is entitled, Joshua Obeys the Plan. I'm going to read these three scriptures and then come back. Joshua 6, 15, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. Not all these other days. Remember, there's only one time around for six days. And on the seventh day, seven times. Joshua 6 and 16 says, And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Joshua 6 and 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, they shouted with great shout. The wall fell down flat, so that the people went in, up, up to the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And we'll, come, we'll go back and we'll discuss our, each individual lesson. Uh, it's just more instruction on what God's plan was. Um, in this battle or in this taking of Jericho, there was some instruction given that all of the inhabitants must die except for Rahab and her family. They must be saved once this city is taken. And the reason being is because Rahab had taken the time to protect Joshua and some of the spies as they entered Jericho. So Rahab, her household, her servants were all to be spared when Jericho was to be destroyed. The other instruction given was that nothing from Jericho was to be saved for their personal selves. Any gold, any silver was to be taken because it belonged to God because he had put this method of conquering before the children of Israel. So it's not like they could go in and say, oh, I'm going to take this little pot of gold over here and stick it, stick it away for myself. They were warned that anything that they, that they encountered had to be turned over to God. And if they didn't, they would bring uh, this despair upon themselves and others. That was, a, that was a strict order. So here now it is the seventh day. They get up in the early morning and they proceed to walk around Jericho. Now just remember, think of, let's think about this in terms of today. Most of us don't like to get up early, and since the COVID, we don't hardly get up before 11 o'clock. But they were up because they had a mission to, to get done. And so it took them some time to walk around Jericho seven times, even though it was a small city. It took some time. And this is all the children of Israel. You know, the, the many thousands that came out of Egypt did not live to see the promised land. God had to destroy them, make a new generation. 
So we don't know exactly the number that walked around Jericho, but their goal was to walk around Jericho and to be obedient. This was, this was one way they were able to accomplish this task is because they were not just obedient to what Joshua said, but they knew that Joshua had received his instruction from God. So they were able to do as they were told, which many of us don't like to do. Somebody tell us to pick up the napkin off the floor. Well, I didn't put it there. That's not what they, you asked. You were asked to pick it up. So they were very tuned into what Joshua had requested them to, to do because God had told Joshua what to do. So the other thing is that when, it, when they came to the seventh time, after they walked around seven times, they were to blow their trumpets and their ram's horns. And then after that, they were to shout. That shout could have been the fact that God had given them the victory and um, to allow them to, to, take, to take Jericho. But it still would take a lot of strength to walk around seven times and then blow your trumpet it must have been pretty loud because we don't know how many trumpets they had. And then they were told, the people were told, make a big noise, shout and make a big noise, whether it be in celebration or the fact that God had given you the victory. So after they had walked around seven times, going to verse 6 and 20, they blew the trumpet and um, the people inside Jericho became very frightened. Can you imagine you see a group of people walking around the building? If we were in church one Sunday and all of a sudden there were 500 people walking around Mass Memorial seven times and all the next thing we hear is a bunch of trumpets, I'm sure that instilled fear within the people of Jericho, just like it would. You know, we get nervous if somebody comes through the door that we don't know nowadays. So these people were very fearful, fearful because these Israelites were in vast numbers. So they walked around, and the people of Jericho saw this and became very frightened. And after they, after they walked around, they, they blew their trumpets and shouted. And it says the wall fell flat down so that the people, the Israelites, went into the city. Now, there is some speculation that since there were no weapons involved, that once that wall came down, many of the inhabitants were killed. As you can imagine, I don't know if you've seen any relics of Roman walls, they were very thick, very thick, made with large stones. And this is a miracle in itself because um, there have been some scientific speculation that that wall fell flat some of them think it was because of an earthquake. Some think it was because of vibrations and from marching of feet. And some even think that it was because of the loud noise from the trumpet blast, trumpet sound, or the shouting. And we do know noise can, can bring things down if it's the right pitch. So people like to speculate that. And when you speculate, it takes away from what God has done. This is God's plan, not man's plan. But most people can't imagine a wall city crumbling. And that's what Jericho, Jericho did. It says it fell flat, and the children of Israel were able to enter and take Jericho, take any relics of gold for God's purpose, any of the rich fruit, first fruit for God. And so this crumbling of the wall instantly became a manifestation of God's power. God's power through faith that, Jer that Joshua had and that the children of Israel had. You know, Joshua could have easily said, well, Lord, we have crossed the Jordan, so what are you going to do? We're ready to go. No, that wasn't the plan. He didn't get impatient. Oftentimes we get impatient with the plan that God has for us. And we know we can get impatient because we've been trying to see what's going to be done with some of our 
past national people. We want, we want, we want revenge, or we want something to happen to them now. But our plan is not God's plan. And so this is a story that says patience. Because, you know, after you walk around a building one time, and then somebody tell you you go six more times, you might say, uh, I'm going to sit down over here. That wasn't the case. They had to walk around. Everybody had to be of one accord. Or this would have shown a weakness in the faith and the purpose that God had for this group of people. Um, we, this, this brings to mind that for us today that God can, can and has his own way of dealing, of bringing judgment on sinful persons or nation any time in any way. He can do it through plagues, you know, with the Moses and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Egypt was was bombarded with plagues. There were several ways that God tried to convince them to let them go before he took the firstborn of each family. So God's judgment is different from our judgment. And in everything that we do, we have to be grateful for God is who he is. Because if you, if you think of ourselves, we get angry with somebody, we want to get back at them right away. But God has given us so much grace and, and been patient with us. So we should be very patient. We should trust him and wait to see what it is he has in mind for us. And sometimes he lets us know right away. You know, sometimes you can sometimes start on a trip and then look like the minute you get ready to go, something happens. You can't find the key. It's just something that gets in the way. But maybe that's your, your, your message that it's not time for you to take that trip yet. It's not time for you to go and do what you need to do. So God has his way of doing things. And we need to keep this in mind as we look at this lesson. This is a good lesson because it has so many stories, especially of faith and battle. But, you know, it's, it's one that says what that would bring, could bring doubt to so many people. Well, that doesn't make sense that you walk around the building and all of a sudden they fall down. That just doesn't make sense. Too many people. There are people who challenge almost anything. But luckily Joshua, Joshua knew that God kept his promise. When, when God promises something, it's not like us. Well, I promised it, but I changed my mind. No, God promised it to you. It's yours. And you'll get it when you're supposed to get it, not when you want it necessarily. So in our um, application of this lesson today, there's just so many applications in terms of being obedient. You know, sometimes we, we want to put obedience in, in a negative term as being submissive. Sometimes you need to be submissive. You need to submit to what God has for you to do. And so we're going to look at the modern applications of some of this obedience and faith and trust. And oftentimes we wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have the faith and the trust that God was going to get us through a, a particular situation. I don't know if you've ever been in a rainstorm or a tornado. You pray hard for it to pass or you to get out of it, or for God to move it on past, let it go somewhere else. So it lets us know that God deserves to be worshipped no matter how he chooses to deal with us. And this goes back to several things because sometimes we become angry with God because we expect him to do some things according to our plan. We'll say, well, God, why would you let that happen? Why me? Why my cousin, or why my mom, or why my dad? But God has his way of dealing with everybody, and it's the way he chooses, not necessarily the way you choose. So in this victory with Joshua, we got to remember that God is the source of our spiritual victories. God is the source of all our victory. And so it's just that the victory is great when we allow God to work with us in achieving that victory. Other things is God's method with us are not always what we expect. You know, we might pray, Lord, I need a, I need a new car. 
but maybe he'll send you a car that's 10 years old, but it runs good. You're going to turn it down because you want the new car? You know, he, do, he doesn't always send us like we expect. You know, we might be expecting him to come today, but he might come tomorrow. We don't know, but his plan always works for us. Our plan don't always work for ourselves, but his plan definitely works for us. It says, God does not have to use our means and methods to accomplish his purpose. And that's where, where we get in trouble. That's really where our faith begins to be tested because we think that we have the means and the resources to do anything. I did this. You hear people say, I did this. Don't give God credit for anything. And you know, it's, if you remember a few weeks ago, when the plane lost its engine on the right side, yes, it was through the direction of the pilot and God's graces that they got back on the ground. But you would think that some of them would have said, thank you, Lord, and some of them probably did, that they were able to get back on the ground. But it, it's a miracle in itself that they were able to do that. So, you know, even though it's like doctors, God gives these people the talent and the gift to help heal. He does the ultimate healing, but he also has them to start working on it to accomplish his purpose. So not everything we do um, is for our own benefit, and that's often what God tries to get us to see. And that's, that's basically what this story is about. It's not the usual military procedure to conquer a nation. It was one based on faith that led to, to Jericho being conquered. God's work done in God's way will always be victorious. God is a God of deliverance and power. And that's what we have to come to believe over a period of years that it is God who has made us victorious in what we have done and God who has delivered us and given us the power and the wherewithal to do what we need to do. And we really should constantly give him credit for this. You know, when you look outside, some people don't realize, you know, they just see, well, the sun came up today, the trees got buds on them. But if you look at how much power there is in nature, it's almost like you're looking at how much power God has. When you see a hurricane, that's power. God instructs and guides everything. And usually mankind has so far been victorious. Now it doesn't say he doesn't punish, because he punished the children of Israel for 400 years by letting them stay in slavery. And then he got tired of hearing them cry, so he decided to make a way for them to get out of Egypt. So we must remember that he is our ultimate deliverer no matter what our situation is. But we must be patient. We must trust him. And if he instructs us to do something, we must be obedient to him. So as we look at Joshua in this lesson, we'll, we'll look at another prophet next Sunday. And to each one of these is obedience that got them the success that they that they longed for or that they needed. So as we go about from day to day, let's just keep in mind that we're not the person that's in power. We're just here on borrowed time and God has allowed us to be successful. God has allowed us to do what we're able to do. So on that note, I hope that you got something out of this lesson, and we will continue talking about these people that have committed themselves to God through trust and obedience. Thank you.